that I remember. All right, so let's get started. Welcome to the Bible study, Women's Chapel 71 Women's Bible Study. We are in lesson four of the women of the Bible. So welcome. I'm always honored to have you here as we do lesson four. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, be blessed today, Lord, by the studying of your word as we gather together as sisters in Christ to learn more about you and what you have in store for us. Your calling for us, Lord, to further your kingdom here on earth using the example of these women in scripture, Lord, that you gave us. And we are so thrilled to be able to study your word in the middle of a busy day. Thank you, Lord, for that honor in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so last week we looked at Ruth. No, that was Esther, wasn't it? Did we look at Esther? Oh, don't tell me I got that one wrong. <laughs> anyway, I'm just still so discombobulated because of what happened last week with our bathroom. This week we are looking at the virtuous woman and who she is in scripture. Now, remember, the virtuous woman falls under the Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs uh, are different types of writings. They're under the poetical writings, however, written by King Solomon. Some of them are commandments of the Lord, and some of them are wise sayings. And the virtuous woman, the virtuous wife, falls under the wise saying. So it's not a commandment. I know I've been in a lot of Bible studies about the virtuous wife, virtuous woman, and so many times women leave there thinking, oh, this is a commandment. I'm supposed to do all this stuff <laughs> in Proverbs 31. No, it is just a book written, but it's a very helpful book. But it falls under the poetical writings. And these books are written by King Solomon, the wisest king who ever lived. And it, Proverbs 31 was written by an Egyptian king that many scholars believe was Lemuel. And they are the words of his mother. So she was giving him wise, sage advice. It's not a commandment. <laughs> These were not commandments of God telling you this is what you are supposed to be as a woman. No. So who wrote it? Well, like I said, many scholars believe the Egyptian king named Lemuel wrote the words of his mother. She was giving him advice. So what is it? It's a passage in scripture about the vir a virtuous woman or a wife that she was saying to, the, to her son who was going to be king, this is advice on how you select a queen. And many scholars believe it was written in Egypt or Babylon during the time of the exile, around 700 BC. They're still not 100% sure, but that's kind of a a consensus among biblical scholars. Why was it written? Because of the themes in this passage, many believe the poem is advice from a mother to her son on how to go about selecting a virtuous or noble woman as a wife. So it's written as an acrostic poem. So now that we have this in proper context, we can begin our study. This is a quote by Darlene Schacht, who uh, is a very famous singer. She said, a virtuous woman isn't ruled by her passions. She passionately pursues an incomparable God or incomparable God, sorry. <laughs> and that's true, I believe. A virtuous woman is displayed by how she pursues God. And that's what we're supposed to do. So Proverbs 31 verses 10 through 11 begins with, who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. So this is the beginning of her advice to her son, who is going to be king. So it should really be titled How to Be a Good King or How to Find a Good Wife, right? Oop, there's a little word feast there that I forgot to delete. <laughs> so this is really how to find a, a wife for a king, you know, but we can still learn from it. How are these two topics connected? Well, what does having a wife of valor have to do with being a good king? Well, imagine if you did not have a good wife. We remember in the book of Ruth study, we learned that Naomi represented the wife of God, which is Israel. And we 
are the bride of Christ. That's who Ruth represented, the bride of Christ. So keep that in mind when you read about the wife of valor, a virtuous woman. Do you think God was maybe using Solomon to hint to his people, Israel, that he expected them to have these characteristics as well? I firmly believe so. Now, in Jewish customs, it was the father of the groom who selected a wife for his son. So how could these verses in Proverbs 31 be about God trying to locate a suitable bride for his son, Jesus? So it could be God trying to describe us, the church, right? The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. Remember, trust. When we looked at Psalm 37 Bible study, trust means someone that you can lean upon, lean on, right? That they are sturdy and reliable. So remember in the book of Ruth, we studied how Ruth was able to obey Naomi and Boaz because she trusted them. They had proven to be reliable, strong, and have integrity. So trust required obedience. We learned that in Psalm 37 and in the book of Ruth. But it is also required for a thriving relationship. If a woman's husband cannot trust her, then there's no relationship, right? There has to be trust. Here in, in Proverbs 31, the author wants readers to see how this husband, a king, could safely trust his wife if she is a woman of valor, a virtuous woman. So you think, well, what if I'm not married? How does this apply to me? Well, you have a heavenly husband named Jesus Christ. Can he safely trust you? Yeah, now we all look at it in a different way, right? When it's in those terms, but all of us who call ourselves Christians have our heavenly husband, Jesus. Now the word trust here means is batak, and it means a place where he can take refuge, put confidence in, hope in. Can God do that with us? Can he safely trust us? Does God feel that he can take refuge with us? And you can see that this woman's husband trusts her wholeheartedly. And in the lesson, I told a story about a friend that I had in a Bible study who her husband had betrayed her with adultery. And it was terrible. And they were in counseling, though, trying to work things out. And she asked me to come to her house one day. And I did. And when I walked into her living room, it was decorated like almost like a college dorm room. It had all of these framed movie posters on the walls that kids would like, that teenagers would like. And it was painted in bright, loud colors. And it had a huge stereo system and a huge television. And it just, I felt like I was walking into a teenager's bedroom or a college dorm when I walked into her house. I was shocked that that was her main living space. And her husband's living space was delegate, delegated to a loft upstairs where his office was and such. And I just felt so uncomfortable. And I told her, I said, you know, later on, I told her, you know, your husband has to be able to take refuge in his home. I mean, come on, this seems like a home for your children, not necessarily for your husband. And that's when she confided in me that she didn't care that his betrayal meant she, you know, their bond was severed and she really didn't care about whether he felt like this was his home anymore. And my heart just broke because that adultery, you can see how it just severs everything. And her heart was still so broken. And so I, I started praying for her that maybe she would change her ways, but no, it was, our, that bond was severed by her husband's adultery. So you can see how marriage is just so important to God, that it represents our relationship with him, that covenant that he entered into with us. He will never break it, but how often do we break it over and over again? Yet he remains faithful even when we are unfaithful to him. But in Proverbs 31, his mother is saying, find a wife, a woman, where she will provide trust for you, where you can take refuge, 
put your confidence and your hope in her. That he can trust you wholeheartedly with his confidences. Do you think a king would have confidences? Do you think he should be able to go to his wife in their bedchamber and tell her about his day or these difficult decisions he has to make for the kingdom? And he needs to be able to safely trust her with these confidences. So after I met with my friend, I went home and inspected my house. And I thought, is this a place of rest and refuge for my husband? Or is it all about me or my kid, you know, my son? And that's what we need to remember is our homes are also for our husbands as well. It's just not all about us. So I like to keep my decorations um, not all frou-frou and frilly. You know, I like to keep them in a nice balance so that when my husband walks in, it also looks like a place where he lives too. Now think about your heart for Jesus. Is your heart a place where he can take refuge and put confidence in and hope in? Is it a place where if Jesus walked into your heart and saw your inner thoughts and hopes and dreams, it would mesh directly with his hopes and dreams for you. And even your house, if Jesus were to walk into your house, would he be shocked by some of the things he sees? <laughs> or would he feel wholeheartedly blessed to be in your home? So we need to remember that our husbands need to safely trust us and have confidence in. And if we're not married, we need to remember God, our, you know, Jesus, our heavenly husband, has to safely trust us and put hope in us. Remember Queen Vashti, when we learned about Esther, she did not do good for the king and she was doing some evil, right? She was proud and too confident in herself. And the king, Xerxes, could not safely trust her with his confidences because she refused his order. So in comparison to Esther, though, remember, she was obedient and she trusted and she provided a way that the king could trust her. And as a result, her people were saved. So we should not do harm to our husbands. We need to do good for him and not evil for a time. No all the days that we are alive and married. And again, if you have Jesus as your heavenly husband, same thing. <clears throat> we need to do him good and not evil for the rest of our lives. So we can't be like Queen Vashti. We need to be more like Esther. Now, this is the part that a lot of women cringe whenever they do a Bible study about the virtuous woman because they think she did all of these things in one week or in one year. No, she did all of these things over a lifetime, okay? And it's just a representation of what a virtuous woman could be like. So is the, ver is the mother of uh, Lemuel talking about herself? Perhaps. Maybe she's saying, remember how I did this and did that? That's, how, that's the kind of woman you want. Or maybe she was describing someone that they both knew. We don't know. But all I know is when you take apart these verses, you can see how you can apply them to your life as well. Number one, she was diligent with her time. In Proverbs 13, or 31, 13 through 16, it says she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships and she brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household a portion for her maidservants, and even she considers a field and buys it, right? She, and from her profits, she plans a vineyard. So, wow, she is really diligent. She makes good use with her time, rising early in the morning and taking full advantage of sunlight throughout the whole day. She has, you know, maidservants, so we know she's of wealth, but she still works with her hands. She doesn't give everything over to her servants. She still does things for her family. She brings food from afar for her family. So what I can, what I think we can take away from this verse, all this passage, is that we should work willingly, not begrudgingly. And that's the part that's difficult for me. I admit that I do oftentimes work 
and grumble and complain. I'm a hard worker. I have my parents' work ethic, that's for sure. But I do have a tendency to complain. <laughs> and I need to get rid of that habit. And I've been working on it in my 55 years. And, you know, I've been working since I was 16. So in what, 40, you know, 39 years of working, I've been trying and trying to get away from that habit of saying, yes, I'll do this. And then when I turn around, I start complaining and grumbling. We can't do that. So what about you? Can, do you work willingly without complaining or grumbling? Remember how Ruth worked. She gleaned in the fields and that was not easy work. You had to be on your knees, bending over. And yet she did it without complaining or grumbling because she was appreciative. It was a law <clears throat> that <clears throat> the poor people could take advantage of uh, to glean from the rich people's fields. And so she was grateful to have that opportunity to do it. What about us? Do we find ourselves grateful for the work that we have? Or do we always want more and more and more? Are we never satisfied? When we get a raise, are we appreciative? Or do we roll our eyes and say, that's it? That's all I got? So we need to remember to work willingly and not begrudgingly, and to make use of our time by being diligent. And the work she did, as well as the work that Ruth did, that wasn't easy work, but they had to do it to provide for their families. And so do I. And so I'm grateful. I don't have to work out in the sun and scrub toilets anymore like I used to. I get to work in my home. My husband's down the hall. I get to look at my little dogs all day <laughs> and in the air condition, you know, so I am very grateful for the job that I have. And it says she is like the merchant ship. She brings her, for her food from afar. She also rises while it is night. And ladies, I have to admit, this is also a problem that I have. I like to sleep in. <laughs> I am not one of those super early risers. If I'm training for a race, like a marathon or something, yeah, I'll get up early because I need to run a certain number of miles to beat the heat. But if I'm not training for anything and I don't have any you know, meetings or anything, I'll sleep late. In a recent podcast about how to break bad habits and replace them with good ones, he suggested how we can't add hours to our day, right? It's a 24 set hour time. We can't make it 27 and we can't make it, you know, 30, 35. So he's saying staying up late at night doesn't help because, because the body needs good sleep. And that's a habit that I have. Same with my son. We are night owls. My husband goes to bed really early. And so getting up early for him is no problem. But for me, since I was a kid, I am a night owl. And sometimes I do my best work, whether it's art or writing, I do it late at night. But that makes getting up early the next day really difficult. So staying up late doesn't help because your body needs good sleep. So what did he suggest? Rise one hour earlier in order to get more things accomplished, whether it's exercising, exercising or reading God's word or praying or meditating. And for me, even writing, getting up at least one hour earlier can help you get more things accomplished. And I have found that that is true. So it's something that I'm working on. I try and give myself at least one day a week where I just sleep however late I want to. And it's usually 7 or 7.30. I can't go past that anymore. I'll get a bad headache. <laughs> so usually 7 a.m. is sleeping in for me. And my son just laughs because sleeping in for him is like noon. <laughs> but if I rise one hour earlier each day, I can find myself getting more things accomplished. And I've talked with many writers who write like at four in the morning until six. And then that's when their kids wake up is at 6 a.m. And they got to get them ready for school. So they get two hours of writing in quiet solitude first thing in the morning. And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So like the virtuous woman, we can take advantage of the sunlight hours and get things done and have still have a good night's rest. But before I go into the next slide, remember all those verbs that we saw. She seeks, she works, she brings, rises, provides, considers, profits. In other words, she's active. 
and we have to remain active. Now, this slide is about comparison. This is Disneyland, the main street on Disneyland. And how many of you have been there? I've been there a couple, you know, a few times in my life. Disney World, I've been there a couple of times. And Walt Disney designed Main Street after a small town in Iowa that he visited and he fell in love with it. So he said, make Disneyland look like this small town in Iowa. So that's why it looks so cute, so quaint, bright colors, beautiful. But as we know, it is all a facade, isn't it? And that's what I fell into early on in our marriage. I started to compare my life, our life, with others. I saw people in our Bible, uh, young couples in our Bible study group who just looked like they had the perfect life. You know, they were on their second house, having a second house built. They drove new cars, nice clothes. They had two or four kids. You know, everything just seemed to be going so well with their lives that I started to look at my life and it just didn't compare. And I became envious of them and coveting their material wealth. I also envied their education because at that time I didn't have my degree. And so their lives looked like Main Street Disneyland, so perfect. And I started to become unhappy with my life. And my husband noticed that. And he reminded me, you know, remember that one time when we went to Disneyland and our son was little and we had one of those silhouettes cut out in a cute little shop on Main Street. And I said, yeah, I remember that. And he reminded me how while our son was having the silhouette cut, I leaned against the wall in the back and a door opened in the back of the little shop. And I looked back there and that's when I saw a, like a desk from the 19. 80s, you know, and an old office chair and all this computer equipment and stuff back there. And it took me out of the fantasy of this being an old town in Iowa to reality that this was a business. And everything outside, including the little shop, was a facade. It was all fake. I'm sorry to burst your bubble if you didn't know that, if you really thought this was true, <laughs> if you really thought Main Street was true. Well, it's not. It's all a facade that um, Walt Disney wanted built to replicate a gentler time, you know, in, in history. And that he reminded me of that. And I said, you're right. I remember how disappointed I was to see that office furniture and things from the current time, you know, and re be reminded that this is all make believe. And so he said, you know, you can admire their, this, these couples, you know, their cars, their houses, their wealth. However, you don't know what's going on in their lives. They could be up to their eyebrows in debt. You don't know. So stop, you know, envying them. And just remember, their lives may look perfect like Main Street Disneyland, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And I remembered that and I thought, oh, thank you so much for, for bringing me back down to reality and not to compare. Comparison is the thief of joy. So in this study, we're not comparing your life to the virtuous woman. No, this is just advice on how to please God, how to live a life that takes fully advantage of your gifts, your talents, the time that God has given you. So don't fall for that comparison trap. It is a trap. When I decided to set my things above and not in the earth, life improved. My attitude improved. And I realized the virtuous woman wasn't perfect, but she was wise. She considers a field and buys it. From her hands, she plants a vineyard. So she considered things before she bought them. She was very wise. And from her hands, she plants a vineyard. So what we can learn from the virtuous woman is to seek out what is wise, to look before we leap, and to count the cost of our decisions. What we do affects those around us. By seeking God first, we can avoid the high costs that come later. Strength. The Proverbs 
uh, 31 woman, also had strength. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. So one thing about her is the word strength. The Hebrew word here is oz, and it means power, might, boldness, loud, mighty. So she's just one of those women when she walks into a room, people notice her because of her posture and because of her strength and honor. She comes with an honorable, you know, attribute, honorable reputation. I remember years ago listening to R.C. Sproul on the radio talk about Elizabeth Elliot. Did you ever know about Elizabeth Elliot? Very famous writer, women's Bible study teacher. And she just, you know, oozed honor and grace and confidence, not boldness or arrogance or anything. Just, she just was a strong woman, someone that just had wisdom when she spoke. Even her voice was lower, you know, and her husband, Jim Elliott, had been one of the missionaries who died, uh, who was stabbed in that movie. The End of the Spear was written about him. And she just was given that grace, that wisdom that certain women have. And he went to her house. Dr. R.C. Sproul went to her house to go see her. And his uh, initials, R.C., stand for Robert Charles. So he knocked on the door and she opened the door and she said in that low voice, hello, Robert Charles, come in. And he said, oh, you can call me RC. Only my mother, you know, and father ever called me Robert Charles. And she said, hello, Robert Charles, come in. And he just immediately stood straight because he realized she's on that same level as my mom and dad. (laughs) And when she calls you by Robert Charles, you respond. You don't question it at all. He said she was just one of those people that just commanded respect. And I thought, yes, that's the kind of woman. I had a fourth grade teacher like that, too. They just command respect when you see them, when they walk in the room. You're like, whoa, that is an important person. You don't even have to talk to them. You just know. And that's how she was, the virtuous woman. She girds herself with that strength, you know, that posture, but she also has honor, right? And she shall rejoice in time to come. She's been through it all. She survived it all and she's rejoicing in what's to come. So this paints a beautiful picture in our minds, doesn't it? Her strength and honor are her clothing. Now that's a figure of speech, right? It's it's a liter, liter literary uh, device that they use. Strength and honor are her clothing. It's a metaphor. She shall rejoice in time, but you can almost see a woman like that where strength and honor are what she's clothed in. The, you know, Queen Elizabeth is another one. She cannot do all this though in a day, month, or year if she's sick and weak or if she lacks honor, right? Well, neither can we. That's why we do need to maintain our physical health and our mental health and wellness too. So how can we do that? Maintain our physical health and our mental health? Here are some suggestions. Regular exercise and walking is one of the best exercises you can do. Strength training, and that doesn't mean you have to go and join CrossFit or anything or join a gym and lift heavy weights, just little dumbbells. You know, strength training is important. It helps with your posture and your core. And then have a hobby. Get a hobby if you don't have one. Journaling, uh, playing a musical instrument, singing. I joined the choir at church because I love singing. Singing, gardening. You think, oh, no, no, you can't grow anything in Arizona. You can grow flowers on your patio. So try gardening. Try sketching, painting, photography. Your phone has an amazing camera. Start taking pictures of everything around you. Adjust the lighting. Give it a shot. Try it. Watch some YouTube videos on how to do it. But get a hobby because hobbies and exercise and strength training help with physical health, but also your mental health and wellness. And you have to have that health. Journaling and having a hobby like that helps you get rid of stress, gets rid of all that stress that can raise your blood pressure, harden the arteries, and make you sick. So, These are just some suggestions for the literal strength part of that verse, but then also the honorable 
And this is something that she does that makes her appear more wise and honorable. She perceives that her merchandise is good. And that word good means profitable. And her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. So she has skills and we're gonna take a look at those. She takes advantage of the time that she has. She has critical thinking skills and she was productive of all that time. And we as modern women can learn much from these verses. She is able to think critically about things that are important to her to help her family. King Lemuel's mother explained to her son that he would be wise to find such a woman, a woman who thinks critically. She uses facts and logic rather than emotional reasoning. So think back to our last lesson where the virtuous woman uses wisdom. She, and like Esther, she used wisdom, critical thinking skills. And think of Ruth, critical thinking skills. This is what we need to have. Even Eve, you know, she had to have those critical thinking skills, wisdom. Now she perceives that her merchandise is good or profitable. That means she slows down. She has to slow down and inspect it, analyze it. She's aware of the quality before it heads out to be sold. And this takes time and effort. You don't want to just slap something out there. I can't stand that. For me, it comes down to like even my, my artwork. If I'm commissioned to do a portrait, I know that someone's paying me to do this painting. So I want it to be the best, but it represents me. It represents God. It represents my family, you know, or my books. When I write a book and I put it out there, it has my name on it. And I'm a Christian, so therefore it has Jesus' name on it. So it means something, right? And it represents my family. So is it profitable? Will it further the kingdom of God? Think about that. I can't remember if I told the story in this lesson or not, but when I used to work at a frame shop, my uh, boss had a quality assurance check. So before anything left that frame shop, frame shop, she would have us do a QA on the whole product front and back to make sure it looked perfect, as perfect as humanly possible, because she realized her sticker framing works was on the back of that picture that we just framed. So that reputation was going with it. And she had a reputation for only giving out high quality work. Well, she, show, she sold the shop that I worked for. So I got a new manager who came in, a new owner. And well, he didn't have a QA system. So I just kept maintaining the one that I was taught. Well, one time I saw him putting together a framed picture and I saw that it had a massive mark on the map board around the poster. And I said, wait a minute, you can't send that out. And he goes, oh, it's just for a friend. I did it for free. It's just for a friend. I said, I don't care. Our sticker is on the back of that. Our reputation is on the back of that. I don't want someone seeing that hanging on his wall with that great big old mark on the map board. We need to fix it. But he didn't. And he sent it on its way. And I didn't stay there at that frame shop much longer. I quit because I felt like we worked so hard to maintain that reputation of giving out high quality work. And he was just so willing to just throw it out the window. And I thought, no, I can't be a part of that. So that's what she does. She slows down and perceives that her merchandise is good or profitable for her, for her family. And this king's mother is saying, that's the kind of woman that you want. Well, what about us? Do we take time to slow down and perceive that our merchandise is good, profitable for the Lord? Well, what is our merchandise? Our work that we do, our ministries. Our marriages, if you're married, your walk with Jesus, your children, your time. Do we make good use of our time? Is it profitable? Even your thoughts, are they profitable? Are they good? How can you take the time to perceive, to ensure that all of these parts of your life are profitable to the Lord, to further his kingdom? That's what I take away from those verses. What about you? 
Now we see here that she also had a strong work ethic. Her lamp does not go out by night. What does a strong work ethic look like to you? I was raised by two oh, amazing workers. My mom had been a nurse for many, many years. And my dad was a truck driver. And when I was a kid around nine, 10 years old, they also bought a janitorial business. So my mom would work full time during the day. At that time, she was working at a, um, a huge shop, um, Shore Electronics. She was working at a huge organization. And my dad was a truck driver. He'd get up at 1.15 in the morning and work from 3 a.m. until 3.30 in the afternoon. My mom would get home at 4. We'd quickly eat dinner, and then we'd head out to clean offices as janitors, sometimes walking in the door at 8 o'clock at night. And my dad would shower, change, go to bed, and the day would start all over again when his alarm went off at 1, 1 I remember that. We did that for years. And I don't know how my parents did it because my dad's truck driving job was not easy. He delivered Dolly Madison donuts all over Phoenix, Wickenburg, Flagstaff. And he just worked crazy hours. And my mom was on her feet all day and they still had two jobs in that business. And so I asked my dad one time, how did you do it? He said, I had four kids to feed. And that's what got me up every morning. And I thought, yep, I can see how that would do it when you have a mortgage and, you know, cars that need repairs and four kids to feed, that would get you up in the morning. So I admire my parents' work ethic like crazy. And they in instilled it into us. So, you know, my sister worked at Honeywell for 35 years. I can't even imagine that. And, you know, my brother works right now doing uh, at a dialysis place. He gets to work at four in the morning and walks in the door at nine o'clock at night. And now I see, you know, I married a man who has an incredible work ethic. My husband in our 34 years of marriage has been out of work for two weeks. That's it. He has always had a job and he got laid off. And for two weeks, he would get up in the morning, put on a dress shirt and tie and slacks and sit at the computer and fill out applications online. And I say, why are you getting up, getting dressed? You could be in pajamas and doing that. And he said, nope, if I have a professional appearance, then I will appear professional across the internet. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I admire that kind of work ethic. He worked two jobs for many years so that I could be a stay-at-home mom. And now our son has an incredible work ethic. He has been working 60 hour weeks he finally got his promotion as a manager, and now he's still, you know, a fantastic worker. We tell him that all the time. So work ethic is important. It's honorable to the Lord. Think about how you perceive your merchandise, right? She took advantage of the sunlight and the lamp oil after the sun sets. Why? Because she knew there's only so many hours in a day, especially before electricity was invented. And our works for God reveal our faith in him. God doesn't expect us to work 24-7. He expects us to rest. God himself rested. Jesus rested. So this means we are to make good use of the time we are given. So then when we do rest, it's that much more meaningful. Now it says she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. So that's what they would use to make garments. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. So it doesn't say that she had her servants do all this. No, she does it. Now, our work today looks slightly different, right? We have computers, laptops, Zoom meetings, right? You know, technology. So our work looks different. But we can still be wise in our work. We can still use critical thinking skills and be diligent like she was. We still work with our hands, with our minds. And now we see that she also makes, sells, and supplies her goods. So what skills does she need to do all that? And that's impressive because she lived in a man's world back then, very much so. Well, in order to make and sell and supply things, you need excellent communication skills, financial skills marketing skills, because she sells them, organizational skills, and interpersonal skills. So she had all of this. Quite the remarkable woman, wasn't she? 
Now, remember, we are the body of Christ. So the body of Christ is made up of various people with various gifts. That's what Paul told the early church. We have gifts and talents. So if we all come together to serve one God, then we are making good use of those skills and talents, those gifts that he gave us. Now, the body has one head. A body with two heads is a freak, right? So we have the body of Christ, and it has Jesus as the head. But all of us, like in the hand, all the fingers come together to form the hand to work. You know, the foot doesn't want to be the head, and the pinky doesn't want to be the heart, right? We are each given our place in the body of Christ, our gifts, our talents, but they work together to do what? To further the kingdom of God. It's very much like music, like an orchestra. And each of the instruments separately sound beautiful, but when they are together and they know their parts and they play them well, oh, now we've got a magical composition. And when you listen to a live orchestra, it is that. It is magical. It's powerful. And that's how we are to be. We are to come together alongside one another. So if you don't have the organizational skills, seek someone out who does. And that person can come alongside you and help you. Or vice versa. If you know you're very good at organizing and you have a coworker or a friend who isn't, come alongside them and help them. That's what we're supposed to do. So we would be wise to always be learning about our gifts. So we can come alongside others to support one another in wisdom. Whew, wow, she makes me exhausted. Doesn't she make you tired? <laughs> How can we learn then from this amazing woman? Maybe she never existed. I don't know. Maybe she does. But we can learn this. To fully serve God and others, we must know how to think critically. And that's a different type of thinking. We must be able to clearly explain what we believe and be able to defend our beliefs using logic and clarity. But we also must be diligent with our time, right? So that we can create that merchandise, our work, our ministry, our family, our children, to provide to the world God's message. Clear, logical thinking will cause us to perceive our merchandise, our work for the Lord, is profitable to further his kingdom or not. That's the message God has for us, isn't it? We are only temporary, but he is eternal. The works he has for us are eternal. The things of this world are temporary. They're that facade, that main street at Disneyland. Which is most important and why? Now, the virtuous woman, there's so many lessons in this passage. So I wrote a Bible study years ago and have taught it. And I'll I'll teach it again soon because I use some of the precepts from that study here in this lesson four. But for now, we'll end here, and I hope you can see how Eve and Ruth and Esther all fall into this category of the virtuous woman. And I hope that you can see how you fall into this category, too. All of you are doing your best to perceive your merchandise as good. All of you have honor and integrity. All of you want to know more about who God is and what his plan is for your life. So just think, reflect for a moment on your life and the work that you're putting out there. Reflect on your children. Reflect on your marriages if you're married. Reflect on the ministries that God has given you and perceive them. Are they good? Are they profitable for the Lord? That's what we're supposed to be doing. The virtuous woman. That's all of you. So until next time, let's pray and then we will be on our way. Thanks, Cindy. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for each virtuous woman here today, Lord, and how you have helped her throughout her life. I know she can look back over her life and see your protection and your presence and your blessing in her life, how you've been there through the most difficult times and how you've been there through the good times too. And Lord, thank you that you will always be there for us. Help us to make the best use of our time, our gifts and our talents to further your kingdom here. I pray that you would be with her, bless her for taking time out of her day to seek you earnestly to learn more about you. Walk with her, Lord. Let her know that you know 
what's heavy on her heart right now. You know what she's been praying for and that you see her. You are the God who sees, the God that we can trust in. Help us to be someone that you can trust, Lord, and take refuge in. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, ladies. As usual, you're a blessing. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will catch you next time.